Sophie, A Murder in West Cork is a three-part miniseries on Netflix about the tragic loss of a French woman named Sophie. Sophie remarried a famous French producer, Daniel Toussaint de Plantier. Life with him was in the spotlight, and according to Sophie's sister, Sophie liked to be alone. So Daniel bought her a place in West Cork where she would escape to, where she wasn't Sophie Toussaint de Plantier, she was just Sophie. Usually, she would go there alone, but this time she had asked her family to join her. Unfortunately, they were unable to do so, so Sophie's final time in West Cork was alone. Detective Superintendent Noel Smith, the Garda Chief Superintendent, led the investigation. There were no signs of a scuffle inside the home, but oddly enough, her door keys were found on the inside of the door, yet her body and blood were found down ways from her home, leading investigators to assume that someone came to the door and one way or another, she went outside where she was killed. Sophie was scraped, seemingly by briars or thorns, and her skull was crushed, seemingly from a slate and a cinder block. But there was no witness and no DNA to link a killer, so everything there was circumstantial evidence. The Garda went to every house within 10 miles and asked them where they were that night. Their initial list was 54 suspects, that narrowed down to 10, and pretty quickly, they went through all of those to no avail. A freelance journalist named Ian Bailey eventually became the focus of the investigation. But in the beginning, Ian began putting out articles suggesting that Sophie had parties and lovers. But according to her family, there was just one, Bruno Cabanet. Sophie had separated from Daniel and spent some time with Bruno, but eventually broke up with him. Bruno was a weirdo who had sent Sophie a screw in the mail one time after they broke up whatever that means. So Bruno was a suspect, but Bruno claimed that he hadn't been to Ireland in three years and then produced a receipt showing that he was in Paris at the time of the murder. So Bruno was not the killer. Another of Ian Bailey's theories was that Sophie's husband, Daniel Toussaint de Plantier, sent a hitman. His logic was that if Sophie died, Daniel would not lose half of his estate from a divorce. Daniel would also receive a significant amount of insurance money upon her death. And oddly enough, when she died, Sophie's family went to Ireland to identify her body, but her husband, Daniel, did not. So some people thought that that was shady. But Sophie's friend went to her house in France and determined that Daniel was devastated. He was experiencing true grief, and the way he handled the shock of her death was avoidance. However, the Garda had received a call from a woman going by the name Fiona, saying that she saw a man in a long coat in a drunken state waving his arms around during the middle of the night at the Calfada Bridge. Detective Noel Smith then went on the news and asked the woman to call again, so she did a second time, anonymously. She then called a third time from her home, which the guard was able to track. The anonymous caller, Fiona, was actually Mary Farrell. Mary was out on a drive with a former lover, and she didn't want to get in trouble with her own husband or to get the guy in trouble but she did feel obligated to report what she had seen, which was a man in a long coat near the Kialfada Bridge. Later, Mary claimed to have seen the man again in a shop, ran outside, told the Garda, and they told her that the man's name was Ian Bailey, a freelance journalist in the area. Just like Sophie, Ian was a blow-in, meaning he was not from West Cork. Ian was from England. After a divorce there, he moved to Ireland and eventually found his way to West Cork. Ian was a weird dude. He wore a long coat that many described as more of a cloak, and he carried a walking stick which some described as more of a druid staff. There are stories of Ian walking around at night in just his underwear, arms up, howling at the moon, and Ian often wrote poetry. He would call bars to a halt and read his poetry out loud, and do the same thing at other places, such as at a butcher shop. Basically, some people found Ian to be quite annoying. Jules Thomas had a home in West Cork, as well as a smaller studio about a hundred yards away that she rented out to Ian. But eventually, Ian and Jules became partners, so he moved in with her, into her main house. Ian was the first journalist to the crime scene. Some claim that he knew too much too soon, and he got there faster than some believed that he should have been able to get there. Then, surprisingly, Ian left pretty quickly, which was a strange thing to do considering the gravity of the breaking news event. In short, Detective Noel Smith and the Garda focused their investigation on Ian Bailey. Ian had a history of domestic violence with Jules, and they lived only a few miles from Sophie. On the night of the murder, 
Jules originally said that Ian was there all night with her, and so did he. But then their stories changed, saying that he woke up in the middle of the night, went downstairs to write an article by hand, and then went over to the studio in the morning to type it up in the typewriter. According to the Garda, Jules told them that she had noticed a fresh cut on his forehead that morning. Ian told the police that a Christmas turkey kicked him when he was killing it. Ian also had scratches on his hands, which he claimed that he got from cutting off the top of a pine tree for a Christmas tree. The Garda also found a fire pit behind the studio with a burnt mattress and buttons, but no usable evidence could be found in the ashes. However, it's worth noting that a woman claimed to have seen the fire burning a few days after Sophie's death, yet Ian claimed the fire happened several weeks before her death, so there's that. Ian claimed that he never met Sophie, but Sophie's neighbor and the neighbor's gardener both claimed that Ian was introduced to Sophie. Sophie's friend said that Sophie had told her about him, and one of Sophie's colleagues, Guy Gerard, said that Sophie had called him and mentioned the writer, Ian Bailey. And last but not least, the Garda put together a reconstruction video with a Sophie lookalike, and that lookalike has a vague memory of Ian running up to her while shooting the reconstruction video and telling her that he had been on a walk with Sophie on that very road recently, almost as if he was bragging about killing her. So all in all, it seemed like Ian was the killer, and supposedly the entire town came to believe so. The Garda arrested Ian under Section 4, which allows them to question people for 12 hours just two times. The first time was the second month after Sophie's death. They questioned him, then let him go and the DPP did not charge him with anything. As time would pass, Ian would admit to killing Sophie several times to different people. One time, he said that he killed her as a way to revive his career, but he later claimed that to be sarcasm. Another time, Ian accused a man named Billy of killing Sophie in great detail. Billy felt as if it was an admission of guilt, an admission as to what he himself, Ian, had done. During New Year's, two years after Sophie's death, Ian invited Richard and Rosie Shelley over. He pulled out a folder of press clippings from over the years and grabbed Rosie saying, I did it, I did it, I did it. Granted, Rosie did not tell the guard of that story for six months, so take that with a grain of salt. But there's one more example of a type of confession. Ian drove home Malachi Reed one day, and on that ride, Ian told Malachi that he had killed Sophie. So a year after her death, the Garda brought Ian in for questioning a second time, but once again, the DPP did not charge Ian with anything since the evidence that they did have was circumstantial. In 2003, seven years after Sophie's death, Ian Bailey sued nearly 10 papers for libel. Since there was never a criminal case, this was the first time that the public got to learn the details that the Garda had against Ian Bailey, which was very circumstantial but also very detailed. So even though Ian Bailey took the papers to court, it basically turned into a murder trial of public opinion. Mary Farrell was brought to stand to say that she had seen Ian Bailey on the bridge at 3 a.m. And she added to her story, saying that Ian Bailey has harassed and intimidated her since then, telling her to retract her statements. During the libel case, Ian's past domestic violence also resurfaced, as well as very dark journal entries and poems about that violence. In the end, Ian lost the libel case, but to the public's dismay, the DPP once again did not charge Ian with murder. Then, Mary Farrell came out and retracted her statement about the bridge, because apparently, Ian is a tall man, but Mary never thought that the man she saw was tall. The Garda had pressured her to falsely identify their prime suspect, and she went along with it. In 2014, Ian began a second civil case, this time against the Garda. His star witness was Mary Farrell. The Garda pressed Mary to say who was in the car with her the night that she saw someone on that bridge at 3 a.m. And this pushed her over the edge. She had had enough. She got up and walked out of court. They brought her back in and asked her again, and she named the man. But it was a lie. So that ruined her credibility, and it ruined Ian's case versus the Garda. Once again, Ian owed a massive amount of court fees for having brought this to trial. So, there are reasons to believe that Ian Bailey may have been the killer. He arrived to the scene faster than some expected to be possible. He knew things at the time that some believed he should not. His alibi as to where he was the night of the murder changed over time. And his claims to have never met Sophie were countered by several people. 
Ian confessed to killing Sophie to people, and on top of that, years later, Ariana Borina gave more evidence. Ariana was a friend of Jules' daughter, and she had flown there to spend Christmas with them the year of Sophie's death. Ariana remembers seeing scratches on Ian's arms, and she remembers that she saw a coat being soaked in a bucket in the shower. A coat that was never found. A coat that was possibly burned in the fire pit. But at the end of the day, the Garda botched the crime scenes and the investigation by losing evidence such as the bloodstained gate and by pressuring witnesses to give false testimony such as Mary Farrell. So yes, there was a lot of evidence to make one believe that Ian Bailey killed Sophie, but ultimately, it was all circumstantial. So the Director of Public Prosecutions in Ireland never charged Ian Bailey with the killing of Sophie Toussaint de Pontier. The Irish system is one of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But in France, it is different. In France, people are charged with an intimate conviction, a bouquet of evidence, which there was. So in 2019, 23 years after Sophie's death, French courts found Ian Bailey guilty in absentia since he wasn't there. The French court sentenced Ian to 25 years in prison, but Ireland refused to extradite him. So Ian Bailey has never spent time behind bars for killing Sophie, but he has been a prisoner of sorts, a prisoner to Ireland. Sophie's family believes that Ian committed the crime, but some in Ireland now wonder if Ian was convicted in the court of public opinion for who he was as opposed to what he did. Let us know in the comment section, what do you think?